The Unshackled Waves, Episode 96. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. We've finally got another interview show for you. On this show we like to chat with fellow alternative media personalities. One we met at Liberty Fest was Dave Pillell, who hosts the talk show Church and State based in Brisbane. It already has a substantial following on Facebook and YouTube with over 30 episodes. And I have to say it's much more professionally produced than this show. Uh, It features discussion about public issues at the intersection of uh, culture, politics and truth. Uh, It has had high-profile guests in the past, which have included Pauline Hanson, Corey Bernardi and Campbell Newman. We thought we'd invite Dave on to have a more in-depth discussion about his show, his philosophy and politics. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good that we're able to now have this uh, sit-down discussion because Liberty Fest, it was a bit hectic for both of us. We were both running around uh, doing interviews. Yeah, it was. I, uh, I was looking forward to attending Liberty Fest and I uh, didn't get to see very much of it at all, little, little snippets here and there. What I heard was fantastic, but yeah, it was interviewing the whole time and so uh, I have to wait for the videos to come out. Uh, I try to uh, do it all, do the the interviews and see as much of the uh, speeches as possible. So <laughs> it was a lot of running around for me. Yeah, very good. Now I liked uh, the I uh, watched you do one interview, and that was good to watch as well. Yeah, you helped us out uh, with the Tony Morris and uh, Callum Foakes interview, which I greatly appreciated. Uh, it was my pleasure. I like uh, talking with uh, fellow uh, alternative media people. Now, uh, your show is called yeah. uh, Church and State, which the, the reason that you called it that is because you want to empower Christians in the, the public debate. But your policy, your discussions, they're mainly about policy issues. So uh, given that, why did you decide to call the show Church and State? Uh, well, there's a uh, really good intersection um, where Judeo-Christian values and teaching and, and moral principles um, intersect with, uh, with policy, with public policy. In fact, uh, I would argue and, and many people would agree that Judeo-Christian values are actually the strong foundation which has been proven successful by the flourishing nature of most Western democracies. Um, and it's actually the abandonment of those principles that are starting to see those societies and liberties being undermined. One of the the key principles is the the theological doctrine of imago dei, which means every one of us has the image of God, and that means every one of us should be treated equally with justice for absolutely everybody. Um, So the important thing is that you don't have to believe in God or be an adherent to a Christian faith to benefit from good ideas. Now, as a believer in God, I think God has some pretty good ideas, but I don't need to say Leviticus to be able to argue those ideas. And and here's where the 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 conflict happens, or the misunderstanding happens with a lot of lefties uh, who actually resent and describe a Christian participating in political debate as an imposition of beliefs. Uh, And that's just not the case because we live in a democracy. The only people that get to impose anything on anybody are the majority. So 50% plus one get to impose good or bad beliefs on the minority. There there is no imposition other than when we're eroding freedom. So if I come and say Leviticus and fail to impress upon anybody the merit of of, uh, my views and, and policies that I'm espousing, they're not going to be persuaded, they're not going to vote for it, and there will be no imposition. But if I can come along and say, look, the the best interests of children and the erosion of freedom and, you know, the the ideal environment in which to raise a child are all sustained and promoted by a traditional understanding of marriage, therefore we shouldn't, um, you know, muck around with natural institutions then some people will be persuaded 
by the logic and the merits of the argument, and I didn't need to mention scripture at all. Now, the truth and scripture should align perfectly all the time, and I'm very open to being persuaded that I'm wrong. So where church and state becomes the intersection that I want to explore is simply I want to explore good policy. I want to attempt to persuade people who disagree, and I want to listen to people who disagree, and that with an honest and intellectual approach to discussing what is best for our society, then we can together find truth. It's not about left or right winning, atheist or Christian. For me, I just want Australia to win. And I don't care if I have to change my mind in order for that to happen or if I have to change somebody else's mind in order for that to happen. It's not about a personal victory or loss. Um, truth is something that we should all be going for together. And sadly, that's the thing that seems to be most under attack these days, the, the concept that truth is fixed, constant, and objective, and discoverable. We've got this, even this phrase, your truth and my truth, as, as if it's subjective, which is complete nonsense. I mean, even, even that assertion is a statement of, of truth. And so yeah. if there is no truth, how can you say there is no truth? Wouldn't there is no truth not be true? It's a self-defeating argument. Of course there's objective truth, and we need to be able to be honest enough um, and secure enough to face the fact that we might be wrong and not take it personally if somebody says, you're wrong, that behavior is wrong, that idea is wrong. Um, it's not a personal attack. It's a philosophical attack. Yeah, I definitely think that it's, you know, immature of people to, you know, just see the name, you know, church and state and say, you know, ooh, you know, this is this, you know, Christian person trying to, you know, in, impose their uh, beliefs. Because, uh, uh, like I said, your, your show, it does discuss uh, uh, serious issues, but uh, mm. like political issues, it's the ones that I've watched, it's their... There, there hasn't been, you know, much, much mention of, you know, uh, Christianity itself. But um, the reason why, for example, the Unshackled, we decided to remain a, a secular uh, website is because we wanted to be, you know, as close, inclusive as possible to mm. uh, p people on the right. Because often, when you do get into like theologic, theological debates, there can be uh, a lot of division. Like, for example, the yeah. um, the anti-social justice warrior crowd, as, as I call them, who mainly exist on YouTube, like deep down a lot of them are hardcore atheists. And so if we start to, you know, get into a debate about, you know, Christianity versus, you know, atheism, it sort of distracts us from the, you know, main game, which is the, the threats to our freedom. And I certainly think that you're right that, uh, you know, we should have an appreciation of, you know, Judeo-Christian uh, values, but we we, mm. we we need to make sure that, you know, we we can understand that, you know, we can disagree on, you know, the existence of God, but still uh, realise there's a, there's a bigger picture here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and look, um, one of the popular problems in, in even this discussion of of separation of church freedom of religion and, and a secular society is is misunderstanding all of those things from the beginning and it's like we have to take it back to the beginning and say whoa 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 what do you even mean by secular now most people that object to the presence of a christian or a christian thought in a in a secular debate is they they think that secular means french style secularism where Christianity, religion, faith, belief is completely excluded and expelled from public life. Uh, you're not allowed to mention God. You're not allowed to mention belief. You're not allowed to argue those things. If you're a teacher in a public school, a public servant, you're not allowed to even wear a cross in, in the classroom or at, at work. It's uh, this complete exclusive secularism that goes on in France, which a lot of people think all secularism is, but it's simply not the case. That's not Australia, that's France. Now, in England, you have a, a different kind of secular, and, and that is where there actually is an official state religion of, of Anglicanism, the Church of England. And the Queen, is one of her titles is Defender of the Faith. Now, nobody's forced to be Christian in England, and they have very anti-Christian laws in, in there that conflict strongly with, with Bible teaching. So... 
but there's no imposition of faith either. So there is an official religion in England, but there's plenty of atheists, agnostics, and, and Christians all mingling well to form that kind of secular society. In Australia, we have the third kind, and I think it's the best, and I like it, and I'm going to defend it. It's a pluralistic, inclusive secular society. There, there is no state religion, but every idea, every worldview, every philosophy is welcome to put forward a persuasive argument and to attempt to influence the debate for, for what they think is a good idea. And this is fantastic. We need a free market of ideas where nothing is given an advantage and nothing is excluded or limited or, or handicapped. And nobody's going, oh, separation of church and state in this misunderstanding of, of what secular actually means. And uh, for the record, church and separation of church and state do not protect the government from religious idea and people with a moral compass. It's actually for protecting the church from the undue influence of, of government, which is what reference was to when jo Thomas Jefferson uh, mentioned that in a, in a letter to a um, congregation of Baptists in uh, Danbury, Connecticut, way, way long ago. Separation of church and state doesn't appear in any law or constitution in either Australia or America. It's just a phrase that was in some private correspondence where those people were expressing concerns to one of the framers of their constitution and wanted to know were they going to be exposed to the same kind of tyranny and imposition of faith by the government um, which the pilgrims originally fled. The whole reason the American democratic experiment started was because they were looking for freedom of religion, not for protecting the government from religion, but for protecting the church from the government. And uh, yeah, inclusive kind of thing that we need to understand. So I'm voting for, for secularism. And you talked about division that happens when people mention, uh, you know, Christianity and does God exist or, or does he not? That's a separate separate debate, it's a separate conversation. Um, when we're talking about policy, it doesn't matter. I have to persuade you that I think this law is good on the facts, the evidence, the data, the logic. And that's one of the reasons why, one of the two reasons why I started um, my show, Church and State, was because I wanted to help Christians articulate good policy and even understand what good policy is. Uh, without having to reference scripture all the time. Because people who don't care about the Bible don't care about what the Bible says. The people who don't believe in God don't care what Leviticus says about anything. So the important thing is to say, well, here's this research, here's this study, here's this logical outcome when we, you know, we can, we can talk about economics or we can talk about uh, immigration or anything else. And, and yes, the Bible has a position and, a, and an approach for all of those things, but it has those those positions for a reason and you know there's a scripture that says don't be conformed to the world but be um, transformed by the renewing of your mind God wants us to bring our mind to our faith and not just to go because the Bible says so and it's that engagement of minds that that we need to promote and we need to be comfortable with as conservatives everybody right of center needs to be able to come to that debate and come to that conversation and articulate why they believe what they believe. And look, Christianity is just one form of belief. Atheism is enough. Uh, Buddhism is another. There's, there's this worldview and this approach that you have and bring to every debate. And to ask somebody to take out their heart or take out their experience or, or take out their convictions before they come to a debate, that's not secularism. That's totalitarianism, dictating an imposition of, of beliefs and no freedom, liberty-loving person should be in favour of that kind of exclusive secularism. Now, the term conservative and uh, obviously the uh, people who identify as Christians, uh, they're uh, philosophically, they can be quite different. I mean, for example, there's the conservatives and Christians who believe in uh, natural rights, uh, free markets, and individual liberty, which uh, I, fair to say that you're more an adherent of? Yeah, look, I, I align very closely to a lot of libertarian thought um, with uh, a biblical foundation. Um, so where libertarianism or the, the Bible or traditional understanding of the Bible 
uh, might appear at, at odds, um, I'd basically need logical evidence-based persuasion that the Bible was wrong. Um, my experience is that in each of those circumstances, um, I can explain why why the, the challenger to traditional um, Christian values is wrong. Um, and we still may not agree at the end of that, but you know, I had a, a conversation with Peter Beattie at the end of um, uh, Meet the Candidate Forum when he was the candidate in my electorate, um, last election or the one before. And, you know, he interpreted the Bible differently to me. I said, no problem, let's talk intellectually. And challenging the logical consequences of, of what he was arguing, um, he had to admit that he had a little more than his opinion on on what he was arguing for. And I'm like, well, that's not enough evidence for for me to vote for a policy, let alone abandon fundamental Bible teaching. I mean, your opinion is not an argument, um, and your arguments aren't holding any water. So, um, so look, the diversity of of uh, I guess perspectives and opinions um, on theology and and what the Bible teaches. I, I don't see them as a problem. Um, you know, there are some people who are clearly viewing the Bible as a temporary, circumstantial, subjective text instead of a, a true and foundational um, moral guide through which to view the rest of, of reality. But I think the diversity in Christianity is generally a beautiful thing. Um, you know, unity isn't lost without uniformity. Um, you know, on the on the right of politics and libertarianism, you know, we, we don't all have to have the same approach and the same perspective on absolutely every policy uh, to have unity. You know, we're all agreed we want smaller government, more freedom. Uh, now, there's there's not uniformity in what that looks like in everything, but we do have this unity that let's make the government smaller, let's make taxes smaller, let's make personal and and all other freedoms as great as possible without impacting on anybody else's property or, or person. Uh, well, I like uh, Christian conservatives uh, such as yourself because you, like, to, to me, like, especially on the free market, espouse pretty much uh, libertarian views. That's why you know, I've, I, I quite like you know, Cory Bernardi and Australian conservatives because reading their, their policies, mm. it's pretty much a you know, libertarian platform. But the reason why I wanted to raise mm. this question is uh, when I went over to New Zealand, I interviewed a candidate from the Conservative Party of New Zealand and their um, interpretation of you know, conservative and Christian values was very different. They they believed that it was you know their their role to use government to mould society you know in their image, which to me that doesn't you know respect people's you know individual liberty, uh, freedom, uh, and and so that's where those are the type of you know Christians and conservatives uh, you know I you know have a problem with and and would oppose. Um, Mm. Well, what's your take on that? Right. Um, there, there are some differences that I have with particularly Australian trends in, in libertarianism. In, in America, there's a, a lot more Christian influence, for want of a better term, on libertarianism. In Australia, sometimes libertarianism looks a lot like libertinism, where you know, it's a, almost a, a blank check, do whatever you want kind of thing. Um, broadly speaking, I think we have to come back to the merits. Like, I'm not arguing against homosexual marriage because I think it's morally wrong and because the Bible says it's morally wrong. And I do think it's morally wrong and I do think the Bible says it's morally wrong. But that's not a good enough argument to win the argument. I think we should vote against redefining marriage because of the consequences to children and to freedom and to individuals. I mean, homosexual lobby statistics, not right-wing biased stuff, but statistics from the homosexual community themselves when they're lobbying for health funds is that they have an inherently worse health outcome than heterosexual relationships. 
for the government to signal that these are the same is irresponsible legislation. It's reckless. It's failing our duty of care on so many levels to say these things are equal when they're categorically not. So, you know, somebody might see that as an imposition of my morals on somebody else. Well, that would be a one-dimensional approach at the different reasons that I bring to to that debate. And so, you know, I think it is faithfully libertarian to say we need to give people their freedom, but the government must do no harm. And if the government says that a child does not need its natural mother and father and that the compound right of marriage and founding a family is the same whether it's homosexual or heterosexual parents, I think that's harmful. I think that's dangerous, let alone safe schools and all the consequences we've seen happen elsewhere. So for me, it's not a freedom issue. It's a responsibility issue. We we don't see no role for government. We see a limited role for government. But one of those roles is protecting people. And if we're not going to protect the most vulnerable citizens in our society, which are children, by saying, no, these relationships aren't equal, and wherever possible, we want to promote the ideal environment in which to raise a child, on average, that is the role of government. And, you know, we're not saying make homosexuality illegal. We're saying uh, it's not the same. It's already freedom to do whatever you want, love whoever you want, and enjoy all of the property and other personal rights as individuals that any de facto couple have. But, but nevertheless, we can't all of a sudden... You know, I, I agree with uh, Andrew Cooper's um, role. I, I'm nearly entirely persuaded that government should just get out of marriage altogether. That, that's the far better outcome. If there's on this question, I say no. But if the next question was, should marriage be deregulated entirely and left to whatever institution wants to conduct marriages, fantastic, because that also removes the potential for for all the, you know, protected class and protected attributes and, and prosecution of, you know, equality and discrimination above and beyond all other rights, such as freedom of conviction and political expression. Um, there are definitely people that, uh, I'm trying to come back to you, to what I think your question was, but there are definitely people that, um, you know, abuse the Bible in both directions as an appeal to authority uh, which they expect to impose on, on other people without a persuasive argument. Um, and look, as an appeal to authority, it's good for you and for anybody that agrees that the Bible is an authority in their lives. Um, but then you have to have that debate if you if you disagree on that. And look, and that's also fine. Like uh, we said in the previous segment, you know, um, unity doesn't require uniformity. And so in Christianity, there's been 2,000 years of us building on our understanding. We don't have a perfect understanding of God or, or the Bible now, and, and we understand it heaps better than we did 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and you know, further back. Um, so those debates are actually healthy and helpful and help us get closer and closer to a, a fuller understanding of truth. And that's where we should have... Um, um, policy discussions going as well, is that let's just get closer to, let, let's allow that we might be wrong and argue it out. The other type mm. of, uh, or should I say, you know, Christian school of thought that I wanted to raise with you is what's called the, the Christian left. I'll try to be a bit more specific here. So, um, you know, the, the yep. politics of, say, uh, you know, Father Rod Bauer, uh, Father, you know, Frank, Frank Brennan, that, you know, it's the, you know, role of, you know, Christians to engage in, you know, uh, social justice, uh, you know, look, uh, 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 and obviously, you know, looking after vulnerable people voluntarily is, yeah. you know, a good thing. But obviously the Christian left, you know, want to think that, yeah. you know, these government programs are what uh, is needed. Uh, uh, what's your take on how that how their approach to, um, to use the expression church and state is? Good, good question. There's a couple of things I want to um, 
pick up on there. Probably 30% of Christians, it's an estimate. I've got no quantification that's reliable or source document. But as an estimate, I'd say probably 30% of Christianity would vote or believe in support policies that are left of centre, um, which leaves 70% that are probably right of centre. Now, I give credit to the motives of those who would identify themselves as leftist Christians that it's essentially bleeding heart syndrome. I don't give it credit for being right, but they're trying to care for people. So I give them that benefit of the doubt. Um, but as a righty, um, you know, conservative person, I think most bleeding hearts do more harm than good um, and end up killing people with kindness. Um, they're just very short-sighted thinking, not thinking through the long-term consequences of things. Um, so that's what I'll say about the leftists who are Christians. And, and again, the way to bring them to truth, um, not saying my side, but the way to bring each of us to truth is to, okay, if we're going to interpret Scripture differently, um, what are the facts, data, evidence, and logic? So, you know, let's have a logical discussion about why generational welfare should be stopped. But some welfare is good. The reality is that... I believe welfare is the church's obligation. It's the Christian's obligation. It's the moral person's obligation. And welfare, you know, individual philanthropy and donations to charity and generosity was never higher than before the government took the responsibility away from us. When they took the responsibility away from us, they took the power away from us. And Christians just go, you want to do it? Then do it. And, and now we pay our taxes to the government and try and get a better government and try and help the poor through the government that way. But you know what? Let's go libertarian. Let's get rid of government aid programs. Let's get rid of these silly things and let's let the church do it again because the church was doing a fantastic job of it prior to the welfare age. You know, 100 years ago, individual donations were, you know, many times greater than they are today. Why has charity and generosity deprived? Because the government wants to do everything for us and now there's no personal responsibility to love my neighbour, because the government's loving my neighbour, I can just paint my house, mow my lawn, navel gaze for the rest of the day, because there is no obligation to the nation beyond paying my taxes. Uh, we're legally obliged to do so. Um, the question of social justice, I've got a little bee in my bonnet about that word. Jesus never advocated social justice. Jesus never did social justice. What Jesus advocated was justice. Now, it doesn't take a Christian to love justice, but why does it need a modification? Social justice. Justice is justice. Anything less than justice needs more justice. So, you know, it, it's this, this false illusion that we're chasing that there is such a thing as social justice. I mean, people are always going to be poor, but we can minimise it and do our best. What we need to chase is that personal freedom, that small government, that that um, virtuous citizenship where, as individuals, we're encouraged to take responsibility for the need that we see. We've been there before, and it was the rise of big government that ended it. It wasn't, it wasn't the end of the church age or, or anything like that by any means. It was the rise of big government. So get uh, government smaller, and you will see more social justice. You'll actually see more justice. Just, you know, this uh, this fairy tale illusion of making sure that a gay couple can force a baker to make them a wedding cake against his religious convictions and, and personal you know objections that's not social justice that's oppression that's totalitarianism that's slavery forcing somebody to perform an act for you that they, that they don't want to to provide a service you know so that's um, I guess that's the perspective that I would bring as a conservative libertarian to as a christian to the whole you know welfare and, and social justice argument is guys we we actually need to do more but the way we do more is by making government smaller making government do less and letting i mean people that call for church to you know not get tax concessions for the the tithes and offerings that they get all the time forgets the fact that they're actually doing government doing work that the government should do under the current theory of big government, welfare, social justice crusades um, to 
stop the church from participating in that or expect them to do it um, as a profitable enterprise, um, you know, paying tax like Amway or Toyota. Uh, that's just ridiculous. The government doesn't pay tax on, on the government's work. Nobody else doing this uh, this welfare and infinite good. It, like, even if you resent it on a, on a personal level, it's just, it's really not pragmatic. It's really not logical because the imposition, the cost to government of having to do all the work that churches do, all the good in the community that churches do, if the churches didn't do it, would cost the government and the taxpayer, and that means you, uh, far more than the tax concessions that churches receive. It's just, it's, it's really cynical, small-minded thinking. We've talked a bit already about the relationship between conservatism and libertarianism, and you've said you do believe that there's a role for the state on certain issues. Now, I said I call myself a, a libertarian, and uh, I certainly believe that you know there is a you know certain uh, you know way to live. There's a certain way society should be structured for it to be healthy, but. Uh, I'm always, you know, uncomfortable with, you know, using the, the force of, you know, government to, um, uh, to force it onto, onto people. Like, and I'll use some mm. specific examples. Like, for example, I don't approve of, you know, uh, drug use or um, prostitution, but I always think that prohibiting something leads to a even worse outcome than. Uh, you know, if we if we have it legal, I mean, you just have to look at what happened in the United States with alcohol prohibition. Um, do you have a, a different mm. interpretation uh, about that? No, I, I think we'd agree very very similarly. Um, I oh. prostitution is a hard one because um, I, I do lean very heavily towards libertarianism. Um, the the problem with prostitution is the severe exploitation of the women. Um, I don't believe prostitutes should be prosecuted, um, but I I'm not opposed, and and maybe I'm a hypocrite here as a libertarian hypocrite. Uh, maybe my libertarian credentials may be tarnished a bit when I say I do believe um, the clients of prostitutes should be prosecuted. Um, so, and I, I think very similarly, uh, let, me, let me stick with prostitution, because um, that's the hard one. It, re it really is. Uh, they're, yeah, prosecuting, prosecuting the, the demand is, is um, probably the good way to go, because, look, I, I don't care how many women say they want to do it. It is absolutely objectification and... Uh, um, what's the right word here? Commodification of people. It's the same reason why I, one of the reasons I object to homosexual marriage is it will inevitably end up, and I predict it now, you can have it on your show and show it in five, ten years whenever it happens, but it will end up in the commodification of children because there's not enough children to adopt. There's certainly not enough altruistic surrogacy opportunities. It will end up in commercial surrogacy, which is the commodification of women's bodies and children in themselves. And so the commodification of women, again, women's bodies, is just a, a terrible thing for, for government to permit. And, uh, you know, under the, I guess this under the spirit of one of the government's role is, is protecting people um, from others, then I believe we should prosecute the men who would seek to commodify and objectify um, the, the gift of female sexuality to a transaction. Uh, I think that's that's terrible, and it's exactly the same reason why we should promote marriage, is because we should encourage men and women to be faithful and committed and exclusive to each other for life. Because not because it's a moral good, and it is, but because it's a social good. It's the best interest of the government and society, and and yeah social socialization our culture altogether is to have that as a as a constant thread so anything that undermines that should be seriously discouraged as to drugs i was having a, a conversation with a, 
an MP who actually specialises in drug uh, rehab. And uh, I'm a big fan of Milton Friedman's arguments against prohibition of narcotics. And I will lose a lot of my Christian audience when I come out on your show and say, I think drugs should be legalised. Now, I think the supply of drugs should be regulated. And, and here's the solution we came up with. This is very detailed, so there might be holes in it, but um, too much. The devil's in the detail, they say. But uh, Milton Friedman essentially argues that by banning it, you create more profit, you create more supply. And by creating more supply, you create the consumption. And, and there's a whole myriad of associated things that go on there. So by the government banning it, the government actually becomes a player in the drug industry. They make it really, really hard for the small players and essentially create a monopoly, a cartel that's incredibly profitable for the big players where those people can control and demand higher prices. And because there's much higher profit, there's much higher incentive to distribute it. And because they control the prices, they make more profit. And so there's more reason for them to get more consumption out there. They become very invested in a large take up rate of, of, of drug use. And, and that op look, prohibition has clearly been a failure. There is no jurisdiction anywhere where banning drugs and prosecuting the users has ended up with a a, um, a a reduction, a positive result. It just doesn't do it. We've completely lost the, the drug war. The drug barons are winning. The drug dealers are winning. And the society is losing. So, you know, insanity, repeating the same thing and expecting a different outcome isn't a, isn't a good policy. But what if we actually made all of those drugs available through a, a chemist, through a pharmacist, over the counter, not just off the shelf, but over the counter, and you had to give your name and phone number, like when you want a strong headache pill. And um, you go onto a database, but you know we then incentivize the chemists to you know create profit for them, more profit than the drug use, so that they actually get people into rehabilitation programs. Now we've seen um, countries like Portugal spend heaps amount of money on the drug war and then turn around and reinvest that into healthcare and rehabilitation. And their drug consumption has halved. It's dramatically reduced. They've had good results. They're winning the drug war. They're winning the drug war by legalizing drugs or or at least decriminalizing it. So the other thing is if we make it readily and cheaply available, we remove the economic incentive uh, and stimulus for the drug barons to promote this, their huge use. They lose the profits because there's a serious competitor in the space, government. They lose the ability to compete with law enforcement. They lose the uh, ability to control the prices and the profit and incentive is gone out of it for them and they then take away the, the supply and marketing to, to the poor dumb people who experiment and get addicted to drugs. Um, now, the goal has to be, whatever the details that need working, that is, it's just a starting point, it's just a suggestion. I'm, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet to solve the world's problems, but imagine if, if we reduced the profit from drugs, eliminated the profitability, and, and found a way to funnel and redirect all the drug users into rehabilitation. Of course, there's always going to be people who refuse those, and there's always going to be some drug users, just like there's always going to be some people who just love living on welfare and don't want the satisfaction of earning their own income and, and independence from the government. Um, but we can significantly reduce the problem. I believe we can significantly reduce the problem. Um, but, you know, maybe we can stop short of decriminalizing it or, or legalizing it. Maybe we can just supply it through those those channels. And, and so it, it's actually the the black market that's illegal, while the, the regulated market is easy and widely available with but as a doorway into rehabilitation as as opposed to a um, anyway, it's, it's got um, uh, it's worth discussing, I think. What do you think? Yeah, I, 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 I certainly uh, favour the uh, 
the legalization uh, of drugs, like I said, not because I think it's good, but because I think that, you know, prohibition does mm. more harm than good. But I definitely agree that, you know, what you su uh, suggested, even if it's just a modest, you know, decriminalization and regulation is still a lot mm. better than, than what we have now. Uh, I'm definitely not a, you know, li libertarian purist who, you know, believes that, you know, it should be, mm. you know, all, all, or, all or nothing. Like I certainly think think that you know we should try yeah. and find the 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 middle ground especially you know conservatives and and libertarians because i think that you know the worst worst thing we can do on these uh, and they are contentious issues you know prostitution and drugs is you know just say oh well you know your views are you know completely insane and just you know refuse to you know work work with each other anymore because you know we um you know have you know, different strong opinions on, on, on this issue. I think that, you know, we we, we should, you know, be yep. able to, to have these, you know, discussions and still be able to work together. Yeah, no, I agree. And look, uh, the conservative approach isn't a, a fixed position that's immovable. Um, the conservative approach is, is let's move forward carefully. Um, let's, let's hold on to and treasure uh, the things that have been proven by time, such as marriage um, and the, the traditional definition of family, um, such as, well, I mean, that, that's a huge one. But, you know, the drug war, I think we can say that's a failure. It's not working. And so the conservative approach is let's move forward carefully. What else can we try? Um, you know, rather than decriminalizing or legalizing drugs, maybe we can go this half step, like you, you said, halfway Instead of being purist and dogmatic uh, about, you know, our favourite pet philosophy, let's actually see if something else works because this clearly isn't. You know what, the other thing is, is it's a huge culture problem. Um, the, the concept that we're just animals and not worth anything is inherently anti-Christian. Again, that, that foundational value that makes Western democracy so great is imago dei. You are worth uh, the same as everybody else and of great worth, higher than any animal, because you have the, in bear, the image of God. And, and look, even that posture, even if you don't believe in God, that posture is, is missing and, and human life is, is now cheap. And, uh, and that's a terrible evolution in, in Western democracy. On church and state, you discuss a lot of uh, current uh, political events in Australia. We've t already discussed a lot uh, about the uh, marriage debate, which has been going on for the, the past uh, few months, and obviously you have uh, strong opinions on. But also another prominent uh, issue at the moment is that of uh, free speech. And, and of course, it's uh, the the law that's most prominent is 18C of the the Racial Discrimination Act, which makes it illegal to offend offend and insult somebody on the the mm. basis of race. But there are also other threats to free speech, such as the various uh, anti discrimination laws that are prevalent both at the Commonwealth and state level. And Look, uh, free speech is a huge thing, and there's nothing the left hate more than than free speech. Uh, the amount of conditions that they want to put on free speech. Um, makes it impossible to continue to use the word free uh, and and it's terribly intellectually dishonest for them to say they want a debate and then to limit the terms of that debate to exclude disagreement of any sort uh, and and that's essentially what they're doing so 18c you're not allowed to offend someone's feelings i mean what a ridiculously low bar uh, it's just it's patently absurd um but, you know, all the anti-discrimination tribunals and human rights commission that we have are inherently about reducing and limiting and putting conditions upon our rights of political expression. And it's an implied constitutional right, but it seems to be inherently worthless because time and time again, we're seeing this march by the left through the institutions continually eroding the freedoms we've got. You've got Bernard Gaynor, who's kicked out of the army because he objected to the army breaking the army's rules about religious vilification, about participating in political demonstrations. And, you know, the High Court didn't think it was worth hearing his ultimate complaint that 
the army was marching in a public protest against the status quo, against the laws in the land, like in uniform, under orders. Now, if he can't say that, what can you say? So you, you have the Archbishop in Tasmania who was hauled through a painful process, the outcome of which doesn't matter because the process was the punishment. Now, ultimately, the complainant dropped his complaint and he you know, went away because he knew it was bad PR for the marriage campaign, and it was because it's terrible. But the, you know, we've got uh, Kathy Club, who's basically been charged by the court, found guilty of political expression. She was outside an abortion clinic offering people help. She wasn't abusing them or harassing them or insulting them. She was concerned for them. And and she was offering them help and alternatives. Because if you don't know the abortion industry, there is no choice. There's one choice when you go into those things. But whether you agree or disagree is the point. You're not allowed to disagree. And and so we've, we've now got this exclusion zone where you're not allowed to express your opinion in this space. There's no physical harm to people. And ultimately, that should be the test of what freedom you're allowed, is what physical harm do you do to somebody? Making them cry, hurting their feelings, you know, grow up. This is some kind of first world Western democracy indulgence where we like killing ourselves, killing our babies and crying about our feelings. These things that don't happen in the rest of the world, in developing countries where they have to fight for survival every day. Nobody's fighting for the right to kill themselves or their children. Nobody's fighting for the right to silence and censor somebody else because their their feelings got hurt. Like you get on with life. If somebody hurt your feelings, you move away. You, you find a different friend. You you fight back. You participate in the conversation like a grown up. And if somebody's going to be like, the, these things happen. Robust. The, what we have to lose by not having robust conversations is far far greater than the damage to our feelings when somebody says something racist. Um, you know, we shouldn't be allowed to incite people to violence. We shouldn't be able to commit violence. We shouldn't be able to touch other people's property, what belongs to them. But other than that, personal freedom is is a sacred human right. Uh, protecting your feelings isn't. Now, and that that's ultimately where this comes down to. We can't even debate proper policy. We saw, it's just so many examples already in Australia. And it's um, it's something that everybody needs to get upset about it because it's it's threatening the fabric of democracy itself to not be able to say what you're thinking and if if you can't say what you're thinking you're actually having your beliefs mandated by the government and that's far too much power for the government to have everything should be open to criticism robust scathing immature criticism because because that conversation is in fact the solution and that's how we got where we are it wasn't by limiting conversations it was by having really really severe debates and since magna carta it's it's been all about limiting the role of government limiting the role and power of those at the top and giving more and more power to the people and if we can't even say controversial things because offending people is hurtful we've got this muting um, dumbing down of thinkers in Australia. And Winston Churchill, uh, in, in all Western democracy, Winston Churchill said it best, the worst thing about democracy is the intelligence of the average voter. But if you're not allowed to get smarter, if you're not allowed to debate, if you're not allowed to reason and argue amongst ourselves, I don't see the intelligence level rising, which is why you and I do our shows, so that we can hopefully promote some intelligent conversation. Uh, the problem with uh, hate speech laws, which the average person, uh, you know, hears and say, oh, well, you know, we don't want a hateful, uh, you know, language said, is that the, these laws are always used by the uh, most easily offended, which was you know, uh, easily on display with the, the Queensland University of Technology 18C case, which, and as you, as you mentioned, uh, right. a person who is easily offended can pretty much, you know, put people through this, you know, traumatic you know, legal process, which even if they, you know, un, uh, at mm. the end of it, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, judge, you know, doesn't declare them, you know, like racist or, you know, a homophobe, like the, 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 the process, mm. you know, uh, 
it bogs you down. And then there's also the media, you know, scrutiny where the, the process know, the... is the punishment. And, and, and so you, if, even though it's, you know, obviously we, you know, would all like to live in a society where we're polite to each other and that we've all got, you know, different views and interpretations of, of things. And it's, it's not good for you know discussion to you know be able to you know be uh, open uh, you know speak our minds if there's there's always somebody who wants to you know run off to some tribunal and say you know uh, I'm offended you know pl- please you know stop this mean person. Mm. Yeah, look, there is no such thing as hate speech. It just isn't. It was a word and a phrase invented uh, at some United Nations meeting a few decades ago, maybe in the fifties by Russian communist dictators who were seeking a globally endorsed tool for silencing critics of the government. I mean, there was no such thing as hate speech before then. Speech is speech. And you you don't get to censor somebody's perspectives and worldview and feelings. Hate speech is just a way of silencing criticism of, of the establishment of the elite. And that's why you see these uh, these lobbyists and these activists weaponizing these laws against the majority of citizens with very pedestrian traditional views such as the sanctity of marriage and the normalcy of heterosexual relationships and in turn they invent um, epithets and pejorative language like heteronormative uh, like that should be redundant of course hetero is normal that's the way human population has perpetuated for a few thousand years. That's very normal. Political correctness, uh, I think it was Chairman Mao who first invented that term because, you know, there's this there's this well-packaged propaganda that, you know, Chinese use this, um, this concept of a harmonious society, which basically means everybody doing what the government wants. Now, it's really well-packaged, but you know, people that that buy into that lie and and that myth, such as hate speech and political correctness and harmonious society, you know, it, it sounds like you should be um, fighting for those things, but you have to understand the agenda behind them. And when they're reducing and eliminating and putting conditions on freedom, you have to stand against it with everything you've got. And and uh, yeah, be more discerning of, of what's going on behind the motives and, and agendas with the things that are being thrust upon us by mainstream media and political elites. Well, there's so many more other current events that we could discuss, but unfortunately we're, we're out of time. So thank you, Dave, for coming on and offering your insights. Thank you so much for listening to me rabbit on, Tim. Uh, it's been a, a privilege and a great opportunity. And of course, I'll leave links to Church and State on the show notes page so our viewers and listeners can uh, check out uh, what you've got over uh, 30 episodes now and uh, there's plenty of hard conversations. So so hopefully you'll get a few more followers. Yeah, and I welcome everybody to join the debate. Don't want people who agree with me, just want people who will talk. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. We have got some more interview shows lined up in the next few weeks after quite a large break. So I hope that you're looking forward to them and we'll provide you with more insights from other people. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.